So let me then begin today by writing down the general form of the RT equation. So if you recall, we had written down the general form of renormalization that if we have a set of fields, suppose we have a set of fields phi 1 to phi n, and the set of coupling constants, which I'll call G1 to Gm, <coughs> then the general form of the relationship between the renormalized and non-renormalized fields is that it's some matrix, which I'm calling Z tilde to the half, and the relationship between the unrenormalized parameters and the renormalized parameters is some general function f alpha of gr. There is a factor of mu which I will write here. Okay, so this also in general can involve factors of mu. kind of relationship is needed if there is no symmetry which mixes the mixing between two fields. So in particular, suppose you start with a general form of the action where the kinetic term was diagonal, say del mu phi i, del mu phi i. But in the process of doing calculations, you may find that you get a non-zero result for a diagram like this. Okay, if we just do power counting, you will see that this diagram can in principle be divergent. Okay. And if there is no symmetry that prevents the mixing between phi i and phi j, you can get divergent diagrams of this kind. And to renormalize this, to remove this divergence, you need general matrix structure. Okay, so that's why we make this as a general postulate of the relationship between the unrenormalized and the renormalized. Is this okay? So in terms of this, then we define the beta functions and anomalous dimensions. So the beta functions are defined by saying that G should not depend on mu, G alpha should not depend on mu. Okay. Namely, if you change mu and at the same time you could change G are appropriately, then G remains fixed. So beta gamma del f alpha del gamma r. Is this clear? This this lesson ensures that you are changing G R as you are changing mu, such that G alpha doesn't change. Okay, and that's the way you have defined the renormalization group the transformations that the unrenormalized parameters shouldn't change. We will also define the anomalous dimension matrix. So gamma ij will be defined by, by Okay, this is the analog of the definition. So this generalizes. So remember last time we defined this as gamma i as z tilde i to the minus half <coughs> delta u of z tilde to the half. Okay, this was the definition of gamma i mm. that we <coughs> gave last time. This is the generalization of that for matrix, right? If you take this z tilde to the other side, okay, it will be like a matrix product, z tilde, the half inverse, mu delta mu of z tilde, which is this side, 
that's equal to norm. <coughs> and with this, I'll leave as an exercise to check. Check the RG equation. So I'm thinking of the phi s as the <laughs> field of phi 1, phi 2 up to phi capital N, these are the levels, right? And SI means that the i th field carries the index corresponds to the field phi SI. See, in this product, it need not be that the first one is phi 1, second one is phi 2, and so on, right? So the first one is phi s1, second one is phi s2, etc. That's, that's this notation. Is it clear? So the ordering 1 to n here has in general is independent of the ordering that phi 1 to phi n that have this thing, that's capital N. So because just to distinguish between the two, I have written just phi si. So S1 could be 5, for example, right? The first field here could be the phi 5. Okay, the fifth field. So the RG equation, so this is what you should check, is mu del del mu plus sum over alpha But yeah, it is all normalized. Thank you. Okay, and the way you derive it is by saying that this operator, when it acts on the unnormalized correlation function, gives to zero. Right? Because the unnormalized correlation function is a power function of the unnormalized parameter. And the unnormalized parameters do not change under this operation, right? That's the way you have defined this eta alpha in the first place. And then we put this z to the half, okay? And apply this operator on z to the half to get this factor of gamma. Okay, when you go from the unnormalized correlation function to the denormalized correlation function, there is an extra extra factor of z to the z to the, to the half, okay? So this has to act on that factor, and that factor produces this gamma. Is this clear? <coughs> so let me say a few words about how to calculate this, the betas and gammas. <coughs> so what is known, right? I mean, when you calculate and normalize, when you take a, a given theory and normalize it, okay? what are known are the f's and the z tildes, right? So f and z tilde, these are calculated. by making things finite. Okay, so we have ambiguity in defining f and z tilde because there is always a finite ambiguity. 
but in any given scheme we know how to calculate the affine side theta okay this is the relationship between the anomalous and the anomalous parameter okay the counter term that is that given in terms of the set so once you know the f s we can say that this equation okay, how many equations is that for every alpha you get an equation so the number of equations equal to the number of parameters that you have okay. number of unknowns here are the betas this is equal to the number of parameters right because for every parameter there is a beta so if there are all together n parameters you get n equations for m uh, betas which you can solve to find the betas from here right yeah, that's how we will calculate the betas okay. now you may wonder whether this matrix is invertible right okay. this is like a this is like a linear equation in beta right this is uh, some matrix okay. the way you see that this matrix is invertible is because to leading order okay when you are doing perturbation expansion in g to leading order f alpha is just g alpha because at t level you don't need renormalizations right so the unrenormalized function g alpha is starts with g alpha and then there are corrections okay. so it starts with delta alpha gamma right okay. identity matrix plus corrections of order t uh, gr okay. so such a matrix can always be inverted right in perturbation series identity matrix plus something of order gr square so the inverse right you just expand it in uh, perturbation expansion so this equation can always be solved similarly when you look at this equation this is z tilde is known okay right? this is something that you calculate from making things finite gamma dot down knots but again you see that this is like a matrix equation if there are n fields there is an n by n matrix gamma dot n by n matrices these are n by n matrices okay so You will calculate this simply by taking this to the other side. You will take the inverse of this matrix, multiply this, which you can calculate, and that's what determines the gamma. Okay. And again, you see that the this matrix is invertible because it starts with delta i k. Okay. So leading order, the unrenormalized field is just the same as the renormalized field. Okay. So the leading contribution to the field is delta i k, identity matrix, and then there are corrections of order t, uh, g r. Okay. So you can always invert. It. So this gives you systematic procedure for calculating the betas and gamma in perturbation expansion. Okay. And then once you have calculated it to give an order in perturbation expansion, okay. you can substitute in this to get the to determine how this correlation function depends on me. This this differential equation encodes the dependence of this correlation function on mu in terms of its dependence on other variables. So you get suppose you start from something like this del mu pi i del mu pi i minus half del mu pi i minus half. Okay. Let's take just this thing first. Then there will be a mass term also. Yeah. Okay. Now the point is suppose you define pi i equal to the tilde to the half i j pi j. So then, this becomes or pi j r minus half del tilde i j del mu pi i 
same new function. Okay. This has now right that minus half j tilde i j minus j is minus j is i j. Plus minus half J mu minus J mu minus. Okay. So this is the original action. This you think of the original action. This you think of the kind of counter. And now the idea is that we will adjust the z tilde i j's to cancel out divergences in diagrams like this. If there is a phi i phi j mixing, okay, if this diagram is divergent, okay, you will need the z tilde i j's to cancel out this divergence. Okay, so that's that's the idea. Okay. There will be also other other terms like you have to add minus half m square say m square ij some matrix mm -hmm. let me write uh, ki ij phi i phi j. see you are, you are supposed to add all possible couplings right to the action so because the original action besides having this you should also have something like this these are not parameters these are these are part of the g that we introduced okay and again you will write ki ij's as in terms of the uh, renormalized parameter. Right? So there will be these kinds of terms and there will also be terms of the form phi i phi j. Okay? So both of these you will need to cancel out these divergences. Okay? So we will determine these z tilde i j's by requiring that the divergences in these are get, and we get cancelled. So, so, uh, we can diagonalize? We can diagonalize? This k matrix. Yes, you can diagonalize the K matrix in principle. Right? You have to worry about whether the diagonalizing matrix is finite or not. Okay? So in general, since you are supposed to add any couplings, right? you can start with a general KIG. Okay? Sometimes you may get by by saying that this is diagonalized. But when you do the renormalization, you have to add a lot of arbitrary Z. But as I said, if you, if, if you take this to be diagonal, okay, sometimes you may have to worry about whether the diagonalization matrix itself may have some uh, infinities. Okay, it is true that given any, these are, these are infinite quantities, right? In terms of renormalized parameters, these are infinite quantities, right? So take a uh, infinite matrix, infinite term, uh, a, a matrix with entries are infinite. Okay. You diagonalize it. But in that process of diagonalization, the diagonalizer matrix may itself have infinities. Yeah, because you are trying to diagonalize the matrix with infinite entries. Yeah. The point is because Ki is infinite, right? You have to worry about whether that diagonalizing matrix can have infinite entries. Yes. Yeah, you can diagonalize. That is true. Yes. See, I mean, the point is sometimes what happens is that if you have symmetries, then the symmetries allow you to diagonalize. Okay, that is different. But in general, okay, you should just add arbitrary couplings. Okay, if you can diagonalize, it's okay. I mean, ultimately you can, you, you can do it at the uh, level of the renormalized theory. Okay. But at the level of the unrenormalized coupling, so what is the general procedure? Prescription. General prescription is that you should add all possible couplings. Right? So you just add all possible couplings. Then you renormalize. Okay? After that, you can make a redefinition of fields. It's best to do this at the level of the renormalized fields. Okay? Because once you have uh, written everything in terms of renormalized fields, then you only uh, diagonalize by finite matrices. So instead of having to trying to diagonalize infinite matrices, it's best to work with finite uh, matrices where entries are finite and then diagonalize. Okay, so the power counting normalizability, right? What is the general procedure? That you add all possible couplings, right? 
of dimensional laser and recording force. And then you uh, use the appropriate relationship between those couplings and the renormalized couplings to make things finite. Is this okay? Yeah, the other point is you are sure that you have got all the quantities that are needed to renormalize the theory. Because that's what you use, right? That you use the fact that any divergence that can be produced can be cancelled by adding a term of dimensional laser or equal to four. Okay, if you didn't have those terms, then you have to worry about whether you can actually cancel those. Okay, so this is a general structure. Okay, now what we will do is to see some utility of this. Okay, because so far what we have done looked very abstract in the sense that okay, this equation tells us how this correlation function depends on mu. But after all, mu is just an arbitrary mass parameter, right? So why do you want to determine the uh, dependence on mu? Okay, but we will see that we can turn this into a dependence on the energy that the particle carries. Okay, and that's why the utility of the RG comes in. <coughs> so let's consider this This is the Fourier transform of this. This variable. I think I probably made a mistake here. This should have been R. You see, the point is, most of these are R here. Right? This matrix apply applies one at a time on each index. Right? So most of these indices should match the indices here. Right? Only on one of them. It acts as a matrix. Gamma RJ is times phi is. Okay? So RJs are the free indices on this side and the left hand side, right? SJ is contracted index. Okay, so this should have been R, not S. Okay. So this is just a Fourier transform of this correlation. Okay. So Fourier transform you can easily convince yourself that doesn't change this differential equation, right? Because Fourier transform involves integral d4x into the ik dot x, right? That can be taken through this differential operator because these are just derivatives with respect to mu and g alpha, right? Has nothing to do with x. Okay, so that you can take inside. So this satisfies the same differential equation. Satisfies same RG equation. Okay, so But let's leave this aside for a while. Okay, we are going to use it later. And now let's do some dimensional analysis. So let's call this, we give this a name. Okay, we'll call this some function. This is a function of the momentum, Ti. It will be a function of the coupling constant, the renormalized coupling constant, which I'll denote by G alpha R. And it will also depend on mu. Okay, these are all the quantities that this can depend on. Right? I have basically included everything, the momentum, the coupling constants, and the renormalization yeah. mass. Okay. Let's suppose that this one has dimension the R mass. Mass dimension has mass dimension the other. Sorry, 
Five. Please tell me now, guys. Yes, thank you. Okay, so this is a finite function, right? There's no infinity. In this, I have to already take an epsilon goes to zero limit in this. So now, just based on dimensional analysis, okay, the other thing I should have said that V alpha, you know, is uh, positive. Right? Because we are using only normalizable field theory, so the alpha are of positive. Okay. So now, just based on dimensional analysis, we know that the following must be true. If we scale pi by lambda, if we scale g alpha r by lambda to the power g alpha, g alpha r, and if we scale this by lambda, we are basically scaling each of these by that lambda to the power their dimension. So this would be given by an overall factor times the original function. Is this point clear? Right? That's why dimensional analysis, if we just scale all mass dimensional, uh, mass dimensional parameters by lambda to the or corresponding dimension, okay. then this should pick up an overall factor of lambda to the power total dimension of this f okay. times the original f. Okay. So this is lambda to the d times f of pi e alpha r and u. What is d? d is sum over i d tilde xi. This is the dimension dimension of i tilde xi Fourier transform case. Dimension of the Fourier transform case. Yes. The point is this is a homogeneous function because each term in f must have the same mass dimension, right? Because, have, because it doesn't make sense to have a function an addition of terms which have different mass dimension, right? So the mass dimension of f is determined by the mass dimension of the phi tilde si because that's the correlation function I'm trying to calculate. Phi tilde r i. Sorry, this is r i. So this has to be a homogeneous function, just from dimensional analysis. Is this clear? Now I can write this in a slightly different way. Because this is of course valid for all g alpha, right? And mu. Okay, this is generally relation. So I can now let's now call this combination the new g alpha. Okay. And this combination the new mu. So I can write this as f of lambda pi e alpha r mu as lambda to the d f of lambda to the f of pi e this becomes now lambda to the minus d alpha d alpha r and lambda inverse lambda to the d lambda to the power d alpha lambda to the power minus no, on the left hand side yeah. yeah no no I don't want to put lambda to the d alpha the point is I am now calling this my new g alpha okay, okay. So this side has become lambda to the power minus d alpha times g alpha. Okay? And I'm calling this my new mu. Okay? So this becomes mu over lambda. Right? I just rewrite this as mu lambda over lambda. Right? And call mu lambda mu. Okay? Similarly, I call uh, this, write this as g alpha r lambda to the d alpha over lambda to the d alpha. 
and then that lambda to the d alpha g alpha I am calling this the new g alpha. This case, just, just changing the names. Is it clear or not clear? Okay, I just re-label my lambda to the d, d alpha g alpha as my g alpha, right? So instead of putting the lambda to the d alpha on this side, I am just putting the lambda to the minus d alpha on the left, right hand side. Similarly, instead of putting the lambda on this side, I am putting lambda inverse on the right hand side. Lambda ki. Lambda ki. Lambda ki. Yeah. So okay. basically, I am saying that multiply each external momentum by lambda. So k is not changing. Okay. Yeah. Because k I am not relabeling. Right? So ki I have kept as ki. These I am relabeling. See? This I am calling g alpha and this I am calling g. Okay? And the, basically the point is this is a functional relationship. Right? This is valid for every mu and every g alpha. Okay? So I can always choose to call this by g alpha. So let's look at this equation. Maybe I, I write it on top and <coughs> So let's look like on the top. So next result is the shape of lambda ki. Okay. Okay. G alpha r mm. lambda to the t shape ki. Yeah. Now let's ask what happens if you take lambda to be very large. Okay, suppose you are trying to calculate very high energy scattering. Okay, scale all the external momentum by some large number. Okay, that corresponds to taking lambda to be very large. So this formula tells you what happens. Okay, if you take lambda to be very large, so of course there is a lambda to the d factor that comes out. Okay, that is determined by the overall dimension of the function. Here you can see that because all the d alphas are either positive or zero, the coupling constants which are positive dimension, they are all approach zero. Right? Because lambda to the minus d alpha, they get multiplied by lambda to the minus d alpha. So all coupling constants with positive mass dimension okay, effectively go to zero on this side. The coupling constants which have mass dimension zero, okay, which are in fact the important ones, like in gauge theory, right, the coupling constant g has mass dimension zero. So the coupling constants which have mass dimension zero, they remain fixed. All the masses go to zero on this side. Right? Masses are also part, part of the parameters, right? but they, are, they have di mass dimension one, so they are all going to zero. So what this is telling us is that the high energy behavior of a scattering process, right? this after all is a Green's function, but you can use it to calculate scattering. The high energy behavior of a scattering process, or a Green's function, is determined by a behavior at finite energy, but with all the dimension full couplings set to zero. Right? Because all the dimension full couplings are going to zero. Okay? Now there is some qualification that has to be added here. Okay? Namely that the, the function, the correlation function should make sense, should not diverge in the limit when all the dimensionless couplings go to zero. Okay? This is not always the case. Okay? Sometimes what may happen is that if we set the masses to zero, then there will be infinite divergences. Okay, so that this limit then strictly doesn't make sense. Okay, you have to keep lambda finite and understand what happens when the masses are going to zero. Okay, 
but let's just ignore the problem for now. So we'll discuss it later. So assuming that this limit makes sense, okay, that masses can be set to zero without causing infinite divergence. We see that the behavior becomes simple because you are just setting the saying that all the masses go to zero, all the dimension from couplings go to zero, the dimension less couplings remain fixed. Okay. So it allows you to set many other things to zero. But at the same time, you see that mu gets scaled. Okay. Mu is a parameter that is understood less in the sense that this is a renormalization scale. This is coming because of the renormalization. Okay. And as lambda goes to zero, when lambda goes to infinity, the effective mu is decreasing. Okay. And here we don't have much insight in general as to what happens when effective mu is decreasing. Okay. You are doing a renormalization with small mu. Right. It's not one of the parameters that you can understand what it means. Right. It's not a mass or any coupling constant. Right. It's just a renormalization mass. Okay. So this equation by itself would have made a lot of sense if this had not been there. Okay. If there is no renormalization that are necessary, there will be no mu. And this just tells you the dimension analysis tells you how it should behave at high energy. Namely, it should behave as if all the dimension full couplings have been set to zero. Okay, because after all, the principle here is that the except for the overall factor, it should depend on the dimensionless ratios. Right? And if you take the, all the momentum to large to be large, right, that is equivalent to setting all the other dimension full co constant to zero. Okay, that's what this is implying. What is spoiling this simple understanding is the fact that at the same time the renormalization mass scale is going to zero. And here you don't have much insight as to what it means. Uh, at lambda going to infinite limit means yes. there uh, you are telling that all the um, coupling constant which are mass dimension greater than zero that going to go to zero. Yes. But means in the functional relationship since there is another parameter mu. So mm -hmm. we can make a combination of those uh, mass dimension positive coupling constant and mu. Yes. So those can contribute in the area. That is true. So that's why you have to worry about what this is doing, right? That this we understand that all these dimension things are going to zero. Okay? But whether their effect is really disappearing or not, we don't know because of this yeah, yeah. mu factor, right? Because there's another factor which is coming in. If this mu was not there, then you would know what to do, what it means. And this is where the RG equation comes in. Because what we can do now is, is the following. That we have a situation where you have to calculate a scattering amplitude or some correlation function at small mu. Okay? But we know that mu can be changed without changing the physical quantities, provided we are willing to change the coupling constant. Okay? So start with this small mu and scale it up. Okay, you can scale it up to where it was. Okay. So start with this small mu, which is mu over lambda, <coughs> and change it back to mu. As you change it back to mu, if you change the coupling constants in a way that is determined by the Renovas group equations, okay, that we saw that this is equal to zero. Then we can understand what the right hand side is. Okay, now mu is no longer small. Okay, mu has gone back to the original value, mu, not mu over lambda. Okay. What has changed is that effectively the coupling constants have changed. Okay. Effectively, instead of g, you have to use some new g, which you will get from the Renovation group evolution. So this is a qualitative physical picture. I'll make it more concrete by writing a differential equation. Okay. If you don't, I mean, follow this physical picture, it, it, at the end it will not matter because ultimately we'll write an equation. Okay. But here I am going to just give, give the principle of what Renormalization group helps us doing. Okay. It basically helps us scaling this mu, which was which is effective mu, which is small, back to a finite value. Okay. So the original value mu. Provided we also change the corresponding g alphas. Lambda to the power minus d alpha g alpha. So we have to change this combination. Exactly. This combination you have to change it back. Right? This was the effective coupling. This you have to change, evolve it according to the RG equation. Uh, then that may not be very 
very small. Well, we will see that that will be very small because as long as d alpha is positive, okay. see that the evolution of g alpha r okay, is controlled by the coupling constants. In the limit when the coupling goes to zero, the beta functions all go to zero. Right? So as long as d alpha are positive, right, the running of g cannot really compensate for the fact that it falls off. Okay, we'll see it more specifically. It's also the uh, constant which set to zero. They will uh, get some contribution because of, I mean, starting which, uh, all the uh, uh, G, which yes. are uh, mass dimension. Uh, Higher, yeah, yeah, which yes. are set to zero. Yeah, that's all you are discussing. That they will, so uh, in principle, they will start running, right? They are not zero, but there will be something else. But that change, okay, it's zero times something, right? The question is whether that something can compensate for the fact that this is going to zero as lambda goes to infinity, right? And what we will see is that, that yeah. as long as the coupling is small, okay, that is always subdominant compared to this one, as long as d alpha is positive. Okay. The only place where you have to worry is if d alpha was zero to begin with, okay, where this factor was not there, this represents d alpha was constant, right? And now the effect of the running will play a role. Okay. In particular, suppose the theory is asymptotically free. Okay. If the theory is asymptotically free, that then you have seen that as you increase mu, the coupling constant decreases. Okay. The effective coupling decreases. Okay. So now you see that suppose the theory is asymptotically free, okay. this is for the dimensionless coupling, <coughs> you start the small mu, okay. because lambda is large, and now you are changing it back to mu, right? so you are increasing mu from mu over lambda to mu. In that process, the effective coupling is going to go down. Is that clear? Because you are changing effective mu from mu over lambda, which is a, a small number, to a finite number. Okay. And in that process, the effective g will go down. The effective coupling will go down. Okay. So in asymptotically free theories, okay. the high energy behavior of the left hand side will be controlled effectively by an scattering amplitude by an amplitude at finite momentum but small coupling because the dimension full couplings go to zero anyway okay. and the dimension less coupling okay, which could have gone either way okay. in asymptotically free theories they will also go down okay. and this is the reason why in asymptotically free theories the high energy behavior of scattering amplitudes is simple. Is this point here? Okay. So this is the qualitative understanding of what RG is going to do. Okay, what RG, how RG is going to help us in determining the left hand side for large lambda. Okay. But now we will try to get a more qualitative formula for studying this at large lambda. So lambda to the d is also there. Yes, lambda to the d is also there. That is the large. That will be an overall factor. Yeah, that will be large or small depending on what d is. But overall factors we don't worry about, right? There will be other overall factors also as we will see. Okay. The important point is what this is doing. Exactly. That's right. Okay. So mu, you imagine that mu is some fixed number, right? That number you don't want to change, right? We say always fix mu at one GB. Okay. So you. Suppose you have gone from 1 GB to 100 GB, right? Lambda is 100. Okay. So then effectively, this side becomes 1 GB over 100. We bring it back to 1 GB. Okay. In that process, the coupling constants will change. Right? And in asymptotically field theory, the effective coupling will go down. <coughs> okay, that's the, the basic idea. So the first thing we'll do is to try to use this. This is just dimensional analysis. Okay, so far 
this equation doesn't contain any information about RG. We'll use this to derive an equation for differential equation for F. Okay. And this is basically Euler's theorem. Okay, if it's a homogeneous function, we know that it satisfies a homogeneous differential equation. Right? That's that's what we are trying to try. Okay, but we'll do it in a, a little more uh, explicit way and see how we what we get. Okay, and just for simplicity. Okay, at this stage, you know, to worry, I mean, afterwards we'll see what the simplicity is. So, let's calculate lambda, dd lambda. <coughs> yes. Lambda ti. Yeah. Ti alpha r. So I calculate it by differentiating the right hand side. Okay. So the first term is d lambda to the d f ti yeah, lambda to the minus ti yeah, alpha ti yeah, alpha r. Okay, that that's what comes from applying this on the lambda to the d. Then you have to apply this dd lambda on this factor over here. Okay. But because this factor comes in the combination of lambda to the minus g alpha g alpha, okay, the action of dd lambda on this can be converted to the action of del del g alpha. Okay, because it's in this combination. Okay, so let me write this, it will probably become clear. So next term will be minus sum over alpha t alpha Because I'm just using the fact that lambda del del lambda of this combination is the same as g alpha r, del del g alpha r of this combination. Because what will lambda del del lambda do? It will bring down a factor of minus g alpha, multiplying this, right? g alpha r, del del g alpha r will just give you this factor over here. Okay? So that's the origin of this minus g alpha. Will there be lambda to the power? Pardon? Instead of lambda here. Lambda? Oh, yeah. Lambda to the power? Yeah. And then lambda to the power? Lambda to the power? So the argument is I'm just keeping the right hand side. Right? This, what I'm saying is g alpha, del del g alpha on this is lambda to the minus g alpha, g alpha, right? So let me tell you. So what I'm using here is that g alpha, lambda del del lambda of lambda to the power minus g alpha, g alpha is minus g alpha, g alpha r, del del g alpha r. Of the same quantity. And this is what I am using. This is an identity, right? Lambda del del lambda of this is minus d alpha lambda to the power minus d alpha g alpha. Right? And this is the same. Gr del del alpha r, g alpha just gives you g alpha r back. And the minus d alpha is because there is a minus d alpha on this left hand side. Lambda to the power d? Yes, that was already there. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Lambda to the power d will be there. Lambda to the power d doesn't matter, right? It's kind of outside or inside. 
And then finally, there is another term minus lambda to the power d mu del del mu of f di This is by the same argument. So, okay, the lambda del del lambda will give you minus mu over lambda, okay, mu del del mu will give you plus mu over lambda. That's why the, that's the original is minus. This is okay. But what I'm going to do now is to is to take this lambda to the d, so you see lambda to the d goes through del g, g alpha del del g alpha, right? Because this, this is derivative of g. Lambda and g are independent variables, right? So lambda can lambda to the d can be taken inside. Similarly, lambda to the d here can be taken inside. And then this lambda to the d times f, I can rewrite as this, f lambda ki g alpha so the final equation then is lambda d d lambda of f lambda ki alpha r mu is equal to Okay, and if you think of it a little carefully, this is nothing but the Euler scalar. Right? It just uses the fact that this function f is a homogeneous function of degree d when you scale ki by, you know, or not ki, when you scale say lambda by some constant, g alpha by that constant to the power of r d alpha, and mu by that constant. Right? Because if you take these two on the, in the left hand side, it is exactly Euler scalar. For homogeneous function. Okay, so this equation is more or less trivial, it just follows from dimensional analysis. So now what we are going to do is to combine this with this. Let's rewrite this in the f, in terms of f. Okay, because I said that 
if is there's a Fourier transform, this, right? This equation doesn't change. Okay. So let's rewrite this for f, this Rg is equal for f. Okay. So this is Rg equation. Okay. And now, just for simplicity, I'll use, I'll consider the case where this is a diagonal matrix. Okay. Whatever I'm going to do can be done also for general uh, uh, matrices. Okay, I'll ex uh, uh, describe at the end how things get modified. Okay, but let's for simplicity assume that this is diagonal. Okay, so assume for simplicity, assume for simplicity. that gamma rs is gamma r delta rs. Okay, so that this becomes simple. So now we get mu, del del mu, plus sum over alpha, beta alpha, let me put the dependence on g explicitly, beta alpha of g r, del del g alpha r plus sum over i gamma r i on f Is this clear what I have, have done? I have just rewritten this equation. Right? Taken the Fourier transfer of this, call this f. Okay, and the differential operator that appears here is exactly the same differential operator that appears here. Okay. The only thing you may worry about the fact that there is a lambda sitting here. Okay, there is of course going to do Fourier transform. This just gives k. Okay. But of course, this is valid for any k, right? I can just replace k by lambda k, right? There is no derivative of associated lambda anywhere. So it doesn't matter if I, instead of k, if I call it lambda. So let me emphasize again that this equation that you have got here is just dimensional analysis. This equation that you have gotten here is the result of renormalization group. Now we are going to combine these two because if you recall, what is our goal? Our goal is to understand how things behave for large lambda, okay. but in that process we don't want to change mu. Okay. We want to take lambda to infinity. Just dimensional analysis of scale mu. Okay, that's what you see here. That dimensional analysis involves a mu del del mu on this side, okay. but we don't want to scale mu. We want to understand what happens for large lambda at fixed mu. Okay. So the trick is that we then use this equation to eliminate this mu del del mu of f. Okay, we'll now combine these two to eliminate mu del del mu. And once we eliminate mu del del mu, then we can just forget about mu. This is a think of mu as a fixed variable, and this is a differential equation in lambda. Okay, which is trying to determine what happens when lambda becomes large, keeping mu fixed. So let's do that. So you get lambda, dd lambda, get lambda ti, g alpha r, So, there is minus mu del del mu, right? So, I just take the mu del del mu of f on the other side, okay, and just add up as this one. So, this will get now equal to sum over alpha 
beta alpha plus minus d alpha d alpha r So you see that in this form, you remember earlier you had this question that because of this d alpha, g alpha is scaling, right? On the other hand, because of the beta function also d alpha moves. Okay, so we have to uh, study the combined effect. This in a sense already combines the two effects. Okay? This in fact I can declare as some beta tilde alpha. Okay? This combination. But it should be clear that in the limit of small g, okay, when the coupling constants are small, okay, this term always dominates over this. Okay? Because this starts at higher order than gr in coupling constants. Right? For example, for the UCD coupling, okay, where of course, there of course g alpha was 0. Okay? This started running at order gq. Okay? But take the mass parameter. Okay? For the mass parameter, d alpha is 1. Okay? It will be d alpha times m, m r. Okay. This, on the other hand, in what m r times g r square. Okay. So, when d alpha is non zero and when the coupling constant is small, this one always dominates over this one. Okay. It's only when this is zero that this becomes relevant. Okay. Small coupling. For large coupling, of course, everything contributes. Right? That's, you know, we don't have much control. Now, Let's look at this one. You see the combination that it comes in is d plus sum over i gamma, gamma r i, right? Now what is d? sum over i d tilde r i. Okay? This was the dimension of phi tilde r i. Phi tilde r i. So this combination d plus sum over i gamma i is sum over i d tilde r i plus gamma i. And now you see the effect of this gamma r i is as if it's modifying the physical dimension of phi tilde r i. That in the RG equation, it's modifying the effect of physical dimension of the field phi r i, phi tilde r i. And this is the reason why this is called anomalous dimension. Okay? As if this is modifying the dimension of the field. Okay, at least as far as the renovation, as far as this differential equation is concerned, okay, it always appears in the in this combination that it adds to the physical dimension of phi tilde r, right? Okay, or the stand, the what is called the canonical mass dimension of phi tilde r, right? Okay. And the radical term. Okay, so this explains why gamma r is called anomalous dimension. Okay, 
So gamma tilde, gamma right, effectively is changing the dimension of phi tilde. And in the same spirit, we can see that beta effectively modifies the dimension of the coupling constant. Okay, although here the relationship is more, more nonlinear, but beta comes in the combination where also the dimension of the coupling constant appears. So if the effect of beta function is as if it's changing the dimension of the coupling constant. The effect of anomalous dimension is it's as if it's changing the dimension of the field. If there's no renormalization, then this would be zero, and this would be zero, and you will get the standard dimension analysis. Okay. These two have quantities appear because of renormalization, because you have to introduce this mu dependence, okay. and in the process of eliminating mu dependence, you acquire these two new terms. If there is no renormalization, there would have been no mu. Right? So that mu del del mu term wouldn't have been there in the equation, right? And you would get a similar equation but without these two terms. So this is, so I'll call okay, so let's call this combination beta tilde alpha tilde. So let's call this <coughs> beta tilde alpha gi and beta alpha gi minus gi alpha gi. Okay, sometimes this term is also called the classical contribution of the beta function. Okay, this is the effect of scaling, okay, how the coupling constant changes without any normalization. As you change the coupling uh, uh, mass scale, the coupling constant scale like this, that's from damage analysis. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is to write down the solution to this equation. Okay. We'll think of this equation as an equation in lambda first order differential equation. So it should be given, it should have a solution up to one uh, integration constant. And that integration constant we can take to be the value of this function at lambda equal to 1. Okay. If at lambda equal to 1, that is our initial starting point. So the final f should be expressible in terms of f at lambda equal to 1. So let also, so I define beta tilde, let's also call gamma tilde r as d tilde r plus gamma r. Okay, I just include the class classical contributions, okay, or the canonical contribution in the definition of this tilde beta and tilde gamma. Okay, so let me then in terms of these, write the equation once more and then we and the solution. So lambda dd lambda f so now looks like sum over alpha beta tilde alpha Okay, and you should keep in mind that these are all functions of G, of the coupling function.
so I'll write the solution now. Actually, mu I can drop because now I am not going to vary mu at all. Okay, mu we just fix once and for all and we are done with it. Okay, but let me keep this anyway. Mu will not play any role from now on, right? Because mu are very related. So the solution is written in terms of a new set of functions. So I have to now tell you what this new set of functions are. So these are a new set of functions, which I'm calling g bar, alpha, which are functions of lambda and gr. Okay. These new set of functions appear in the argument of f, as well as in the argument of gamma tilde ri, okay, because gamma tilde ri was a function of the coupling constants, okay, but instead of the coupling constant, you have to now specify for this new g bar. So this G bar is a solution to another differential equation. These two lines define G bar alpha. No, so you can say G bar alpha R. Oh, yeah, yeah, G bar alpha R, thank you. Actually, let's start from, I just put it as this. It just makes things too cumbersome. Okay. G bar alpha is a function. Okay, it's a finite function, so it's a. Okay. You know, my John, you know, doesn't matter. So just call it G bar alpha. So let me explain what this is. This is. Let me first explain what this is. Okay. This looks a little complicated equation. Okay. But this equation is basically this. So take lambda, d d lambda, of g bar alpha of lambda. 
Okay, so Jibar alpha, let, let me run right now, write the argument right now. Jibar alpha is equal to beta tilde alpha of Jibar. Beta tilde alpha is a function of the coupling constant. Okay? It depends on the G1, G2 up to uh, G1, R, G2, R up to <coughs> Gn. So what this equation is telling us that g bar alpha, define, define a quantity g bar alpha that solves that function of lambda. Okay? And the lambda dependence is determined by solving lambda dd alpha g bar alpha is beta tilde alpha evaluated at g bar. Is this clear? So this determines g bar as a function of lambda. Okay? But this of course requires a initial condition. Because it is a first order differential equation. Right? So, what is that initial condition? The initial condition that you put is that g bar alpha at lambda equal to 1 is equal to g alpha. This basically means that g bar alpha now becomes a function of lambda and gr, all components of the coupling constant. Because Lambda enters because this determines the lambda dependence, right? and gr enters because the initial condition depends on g, gr. Okay, so that's why g bar defined by these two equations, okay, which are written here in a, in a more expanded form, gives a function of lambda and the renormalized couplings, g1 r, g2 r up to. Yeah. So you first calculate this function by solving this differential equation. Then substitute clear. So the first line should be clear. It just says that you take f, but in the argument where there is g alpha, you replace g bar alpha. Okay, so that's why it becomes a it acquires a lambda dependence. Okay, it of course also depends on gr, but it also depends on lambda. And then there is an exponential factor which also requires knowledge about the anomalous dimension, gamma tilde ri, okay, what's the uh, canonical dimension plus anomalous dimension, that of course is a function of the coupling constant. But in the argument, where the coupling constant was there, you replace it by g bar, g bar of lambda prime. And then you integrate this over lambda prime, from one to lambda. So the claim is that this function as defined, okay, lambda dependence of the right hand side is completely fixed because lambda dependence on g bar is completely fixed by this. So the claim is that this function solves the differential equation that we derived. What is the first factor on the right hand side? F. This? Yeah. Yeah. So this gives you f at lambda equal to 1. We have said already that we cannot determine uh, uh, this without putting an initial condition, right. right? So we have to assume that at lambda equal to one, we know how, how to calculate this, okay. right? So this is f at lambda equal to one. Okay, it's okay. already okay. assumed to be known. Yeah, that is assumed to be known. That at lambda equal to one, it's a finite energy scattering, right? right? It's assumed to be known. Okay. In terms of that, we are trying to determine f at large lambda. Yes. Okay. But what we are saying here is that at lambda equal to one. You don't use G alpha, you use this G bar alpha, okay, which has a lambda dependence. And then there is an explicit multiplicity factor. So this F at lambda equal to 1, yes. is this calculated or? Yes, so this is something that you have to calculate, right? Then if you, can, if you calculate F at lambda equal to 1, right? At, <coughs> this tells you how to calculate f at higher, higher. This is okay. See, this doesn't look like too much of a simplification because after all, at lambda equal to one, you have to do the calculation anyway, right? So why does it, uh, I mean, help us? Okay. It helps us if for large lambda this is small. You see, if for large lambda this is small, right? That means that you don't have to go too high in the perturbation of expansion, right? If the coupling constants become small at large lambda, 
Yeah, there's lambda inside, right? So this thing, so this is lambda equal to one. This this has become finite energy, right? Yeah. But if the effective coupling becomes small, then you can just do the first order perturbation and be done with it. Okay, that's the utility of the of this equation. Okay, that if the coupling, the effective coupling is small, okay, where effective coupling is at G bar, okay, then this is helpful. Is this point clear? Okay, so the proof of this, the proof that this satisfies the differential equation is a uh, is somewhat invert, and so I'll postpone it till tomorrow. Okay. So what I'll try to describe in the next two minutes, maybe how we make use of this. <coughs> Exactly, yeah. Actually, how lambda and G bar will change, that is controlled by how GR changed. That's controlled by this equation. Yeah, there should be some connection as well. It's the same equation. If you look at the, that equation is roughly basically the same equation, right? With the change of sign, right? So, you can see what, what happens from this. So you can already see here that suppose beta was negative. Okay. Then take a beta was negative for positive G. Right? Let's take the coupling constant to be positive. If beta was negative, then you can see that as lambda increases, if you start with a small G bar, it decreases it further. Right? Because the left hand side is negative. So as lambda becomes larger, the G falls off. Okay? That's what that what we mean by an asymptotically free theory, negative beta function. Okay. And in that case, effective G bar that will enter here will be small. Okay. Then this equation is not very helpful in understanding how what happens at high energy. Right? If at high energy the GR started growing, okay. then the perturbation theory becomes worse right? by doing this. So this, this equation for high energy behavior is helpful if the theory is asymptotically free. Okay. So let me work out the case of gauge theories. So gauge theories. So it has three parameters, G, alpha, and m. Alpha and Emma, right? As far as Emma is concerned, it has positive dimension. Okay? It has positive as far as Emma, the D is 1. Okay. So when you have the corresponding equation, lambda, dd lambda of M R bar or M bar. Okay, I'm not. I'm dropping the yeah. R from this part. Right? Lambda dd lambda of m bar. Okay. There is a term on the right hand side that minus d alpha d alpha term that gives you minus m bar. Okay. And then there is a beta times m bar. Beta times m bar. Pardon? Yeah. First term is coming because of the minus d alpha in the H beta tilde alpha was beta alpha minus d alpha g alpha. Right? So it's coming from here. Okay, instead of g alpha after all substitute g bar. Because the argument of this is g bar. Okay, that's why the minus m bar is coming. And then there's a uh, beta m, which are beta m. But beta m is small because it has already it already has power of g. Right? For small g, this is small. This is a dominant contribution. And okay? that's what we are saying that if the coupling constant is small, then the canonical dimension dominates. Okay. 
So this tells us that m bar is basically m bar basically m bar of lambda goes as equal to minus lambda. Right? The solution of this is m bar is equal to minus lambda. So it goes down very fast with lambda. Right? M bar you don't have to worry about. M bar is going to zero. Alpha is dimensionless. Okay, so you have to worry about how alpha runs. But alpha, of course, is a gauge fixing parameter. Right? And as you have been arguing, the physical quantities doesn't depend on alpha. And alpha may get renormalized. The Gaines functions the, will depend on alpha. Okay, if you try to calculate the ghost Gaines function or the gauge field Gaines function, they will depend on alpha. But physical quantities are alpha independent. So you don't really have to worry about how alpha runs. Okay, if you want to calculate the behavior of the Gaines functions, yes, then you will need how, how alpha runs. But for physical quantities, you don't need to know how alpha runs. Right? So let's, let's forget about alpha. Alpha is alpha does not have a physical Lambda DT lambda. So this is basically the way it should scale under canonical scaling, right? That was that we saw the lambda to the power minus g alpha was coming in, right? In the relation that we wrote, right? there's a lambda to the minus g alpha g alpha. This is just a reflection of that lambda to the minus. Let's now focus on G. Okay, the, this one. So lambda dd lambda of G bar is beta tilde G of G bar. G of course has canonical dimension zero. Okay, so G alpha is zero. So this is just A G times G bar Q. This is what we had calculated the last time, right? The beta function for G is A G times G Q. A G is negative. Right? So A G is negative. A G is less than zero. So let's call A G equal to minus two. So the equation is lambda dd lambda of g bar is minus d g bar q. Okay, so this equation can be easily integrated. There are higher order corrections, right? But for small g bar, you don't worry about the higher order corrections. Okay. So when we integrate this equation, you get d g bar over g bar q is d d lambda over lambda. So, 1 over 2 g bar squared is d log lambda plus a constant and this constant is determined by saying that at lambda equal to 1, g bar must be equal to gr. That's the initial condition, right? That's g bar alpha at lambda equal to 1 is g alpha. Okay. So at lambda equal to 1, at lambda equal to 1, g bar is gr. So this determines that this constant as 1 over gr square, 2 gr square. Okay. <coughs> so 
you can invert this. You can get g bar square as g bar square over I just rewrote this equation in this form. Okay. And now you see that indeed, when lambda becomes large, g, g bar square falls off. Okay. Falls off slowly, but it falls off. So this goes as 1 over 2b log lambda for large lambda. So for sufficiently large lambda, if this is small, then we consider you can just work lowest order perturbation theory. Higher order corrections will be small. Okay? Not too small, they are down by powers of 1 over log lambda. Okay? Because the coupling constant goes as of 1 over log lambda. Okay? So this is the meaning of asymptotic freedom. That once you have a theory which is asymptotically free, which basically means that when you solve this equation, the Coupling constant, the dimensionless coupling constant in terms of which you do perturbation, okay. those become small at large lambda. Okay. Then you can extract the high energy behavior of scattering amplitude with the help of this Ramos and Roth equation. Okay. And the advantage is that on the right hand side, the effective coupling becomes small. Pardon? Yes, so the exponential factor has to be evaluated, but we'll do it uh, uh, sometime later. Right? That if once you have determined this g bar, right, we can now substitute in the exponential factor and integrate. Right? Then see what we get. Okay, so when once this is done, then everything can be evaluated systematically. Is that clear? Because after all, gamma, which entered in the integral, had a power series expansion in G, right? So there you replace GR by GR, G bar, right? G bar is this. You have a known function of lambda, or lambda prime, that is in the integral. It was integrated. Okay? That's the leading order function. Okay, so I'll stop here today. So next time we'll first give a proof, okay? That will probably take the whole of tomorrow, <laughs> because proving it will involve several steps. Okay, the proof that the solution that I have given actually satisfies RG, or the equation that I derived. Okay. And then we'll discuss some further applications of this. Yes. Why is this magic happening? Why is this magic happening? Yeah. Well, the point is it's happening because of the following, that if mu had not been there, yeah. then you know that the magic would have been there just by dimension analysis. Okay. Right? Now the reason that that is not happening is because of the mu. Right? Mu introduces an extra complication. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, we know that the how things depend on mu is determined by RG equation. Right. Right? Because RG equation tells us that you can change mu and change other coupling constant right. to leave the theory unchanged. Right? So the what you have lost right, by mu dependence, you can get back with the help of the RG. Okay, that's why you can use high energy, uh, this analysis to determine the high energy behavior okay, of the uh, amplitude. Okay. The extra thing that is happening here, which wouldn't have been, ha wouldn't have been there if there's no renormalization, okay, is that instead of g bar, okay. we just get g, gr. There will be no running. Yeah. Okay, except for this, uh, uh, for the dimension, for the ones which have canonical dimension, right? There will be standard running like 1 over lambda, right? The lambda to the minus g alpha. The extra thing that is happening here is that there is an additional running of the coupling constant right, because of the renormalization. Mm -hmm. And if the theory is asymptotically free, that helps us. Right, that helps us because effectively G decreases. Yeah. 
right? Otherwise, you would have remained constant. Yeah. Okay. Then it it will not help us very much. Yeah, exactly. So the point is like, uh, if I have let's say some uh, gluons at some en uh, energy at low energy, and same thing at high energy. Mm -hmm. At low energy, I need to compute more, but yes. at high energy, I need to compute less. That's so, right. so w just looking at them in terms of some physical particles, w what's going on? I so, the effective interaction is becoming small yeah. at high energy. Why? Well, <laughs> I mean, the effective interaction depends on the energy, right? Yeah. Because uh, there are various screening effects. Yeah. Now, why it becomes weak and not strong? Mm -hmm. That depends on the details of the theory. Yeah. Right? The details of the theory here is such. That the effective interaction is becoming weak. Okay. Right? It, is, it is not guaranteed. In fact, in fact, I mean, what the what the way historically it was discovered is that people first discovered in actual scattering that as if at high energy things behave like free particles. Yes. Right? You take scattered protons and you find that at high energy things are behaving more and more like free particles. Right? So that then people immediately know that we need some theory whose beta function is negative. Right? Because this whole analysis of scaling, right, and Ramanujan proof. This existed even before this experimental discovery, right? But people didn't know of any theory which has negative beta function, mm -hmm. right? And then people searched and found that the non-abelian gauge theories have negative beta function, mm -hmm. right? But this is not something that you could have guessed without actually doing the calculation, mm -hmm. right? So that in that <coughs> sense, if, I mean, there is no deeper understanding of why specifically for non-abelian gauge theory is negative, mm -hmm. and for other theories it's positive. Right? It's like for other theories, if you are trying to do this. You run into yeah, worse situation, right? Your coupling constant is increasing. Exactly. So then you will say, okay, it's not a magic, but it, nevertheless, it has an effect, right? Yeah. So sometimes if you lose, sometimes you may also get it, right? Yeah. So in most theories, you will lose because at high energy things become strong. Mm -hmm. Okay. But in non-abelian gauge theories, you win because at high energy things become weak. Okay, but this is not something that one could have guessed without doing this experiment. Yeah. So magic will remain magic. Well, I mean, the point is, if, if it increases, you will not call it magic, right? Yeah. But nevertheless, it's the fact that it's changing itself, you can call it magic, right? Yeah. But that you understand. It happens because of the realization, right? And then it's just a question of science. Right, right, right. So, what you know is the coupling constant will change as a function of lambda, right? Because that's just this equation. Effective coupling will change. Mm -hmm. Whether it increases or decreases depends on the details. Just from this equation, we try to naively look at low energy scattering. So if you take lambda to be less than one, yes. then it seems like this will develop a pole. So that is probably not correct because the perturbation theory will break. Exactly. The point is, once this becomes <coughs> strong, right? See, lambda becoming before it becomes pole, g bar is becoming a power one, right? right. So and once g bar becomes a power one, then the equation that you have used okay. to integrate. Right? That breaks down because you have strong to a G bar cube, right? and also G bar to the five terms on the right hand side, right? So you have to include all of them right. and see what the effect is. So this can be only used for a very high energy exactly. information. Exactly. That's right. Okay. Or if the sign was negative, yeah. one could have tried to use it for low energy. Low energy. Then the high energy will be problematic. Exactly. Then the high energy will be problematic. Then you try to then try to use it for low energy. Okay, but for low energy, of course, there are other issues, right? Because all the masses will start becoming large. Effective masses will becoming large, right? which may or may not help sometimes. Right? If there are couplings, like yeah, yeah. phi cube coupling in four dimension, right? The corresponding coefficient has a positive mass dimension, right? and that coupling will also start growing. Okay, so you have to worry about those. Yes, you can choose anything that you like. Like with some fixed number, and then you are asking what happens for large lambda, because that reference point is just an integration constant, right? Because when you integrate it, you ex express in terms of lambda f at some value of lambda, right? Which you took to be lambda equal to one, but you could have expressed in terms of f at lambda equal to two also. Okay, I I gave the answer in terms of f at lambda equal to one. I could have also given the answer in terms of f at lambda equal to 2.
I mean, then every five, five lambda is equal to one, you have to change, take lambda equal to Okay, so then tomorrow it will be at regular time, from two to three. 